Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dropping the Gloves. Thanks for joining us here at Tax, tax Day, Tim. Did you get your taxes in in the USA? Oh, I did it like a month and a half ago. I've been Ooh, done. Me too. I, I actually did mine earlier too. It felt it felt good. It felt good. Did you have to pay in any because you're so rich? No, no. I got the biggest refund I've ever gotten just because because last year I was running a business for the first time with my uh entrepreneur stuff so everything's written off and it was great i was very everything's a business lunch (laughs) just thinking about your business everything just though though they're gonna get you you gotta be careful those irs they're sneaky sneaky i was good all right very good well did you have a good weekend tim how did everything work out for you i did i want to talk about the dinner that i went to on friday that um a buddy of mine here in town invited me to like two months ago. He's like, Hey, do you want to go to this restaurant? It's called counter here in right in Charlotte. And it's basically like a, it's a fancy, it's a fancy restaurant, but it's more than just a fancy food. It's like a whole experience. And they do with like the main offer is like you, you sit on a counter, it's like a big U shape and you face the kitchen. So you walk, you watch while they work and prepare their food and they bring it out to you. And they're all based on like themes. And there's like, the music is curated. The art is curated. Like everything is very, very fancy. And like just the service is, is, is top notch. But then there's have like a, another side of the restaurant that we were on that was like all their big hits. So it's like, it's still the same culinary chef, the same service and food and, and the prices, but um, you just don't watch them. You don't watch them do it. So it was like, Hey, we're doing this for my birthday. Um, you want to come and bring Julia? I said, yeah, let's, we'll, we'll do it. And it's expensive. And I paid him ahead of time. And instead, up front, like, this includes the meal, seven courses, and a um, and it includes tip. And so we're like, okay, great. It's a lot of money, but pay up front, whatever. And um, so we go in. It's, it's like, kind of dark, and there's curtains everywhere. And the um, they sit us a little table of six, and they ask us how we want to do the wine. And there's three options. There's, like, it's called, like, the global option, which is expensive. And it includes like they pair a specific line wine with each of the seven courses that is like, you know, I'm like, okay, fine. Then they had one that was absurd that included like wine plus other stuff that was like 250 bucks a person just for, just for the drinks. And then another one that was like, I don't know, like a vegan option or something. And so we just did the basic one. And so every, like they pace it out pretty well. Seven courses took three hours. So every 25 minutes or so, they're bringing out a new course. And the first one's like salmon with um, little rice crackers and like a fancy dill cream sauce thing. And um, it was good, like capers and things like that. And then they get into the meals kind of get prog- progressively more sophisticated. Um, and I ate some things I would never, ever order. Um, one of the one of the meals was a, um, a, one of the uh, trays was a little barbecue type thing so they had like a, a chicken sausage that was very very good and a chicken wing that was or some kind of boned piece and there was also a chicken heart which i ate and and so the whole which is gross it was like this the the rubbery like a little sausage like a real snap to it i uh i think we ate two of them each um but the whole thing felt and i don't want to just say i didn't enjoy it because i did but it was very like posh and very um um, pretentious in a way, you know, like, so the, the waiter will bring out the meal and he'll bring out a bottle of wine that he's serving with the meal. And he explains like what we're supposed to be thinking about while, it, while we drink the wine. It's like, imagine a starry sky with mountains on each side. Oh my and, gosh. And like, and then you get a specific wind, uh, a scent through the wind of a little hint of lavender, just touch a lavender in this enjoy. And he like bows, you know, and like, like he just, it was a little performance that he had just done for us. Um, and so they all loved it. They're all like foodies. They're like taking pictures of every course. They can't wait to come back. They want to do the counter side and watch them work. And like it, for me, it was like a cool experience to try it one time. I hope I don't, well, I don't know if I'll be going back again anytime soon. And the whole thing was like, you do get full and they pace it out well. So there's even seven tiny dishes, just it adds up. But it was very expensive. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, a nice restaurant. And I could go get across the street and get like a beer and a nice restaurant for like 40 bucks. You know, a good meal mm-hmm. just for myself. And this is, I won't say it, but it was hundreds, you know, so. No, no, no. You're you're saying because you've, <laughs> you've mentioned it four times now, very expensive. It was so very I'm expensive. guessing, let me, let me just guess. 
Okay. So I'm guessing your drink add-on, which was the lowest one, was like $100. $80, yeah. $80 per person. Per person. And so just doing that math, I bet you a seven-course meal with all the coupe Germans and crap like that was three fifty a person? No, it wasn't that expensive. It oh. was about, yeah, it was less. It was like one twenty a person. Um, Tim, that's not much. Stop. Well, plus the, I mean, plus two people, Julia. But tips included in that, so that's like a hundred dollar dinner. Well, that was no, it was like a four hundred dollar night, and um, and so anyway, so it was good. I mean, some of it was really good. Some of it I would never, I would never order. But it, they're like, it's an experience, and they keep talking about that. And they're they're not chefs; they're artists with their food, and oh, that's, that's the kind so of stuff crap. That was pretentious. So. I yeah. mean, I mean, you must have gone to a lot of nice restaurants. Did you ever do anything like that? Yeah, a few times. And every time I leave disappointed, every single time. There hasn't been one time where I've gone to a, a, an event like that where I've left. I'm like, that was a good idea. You always leave pissed off and you're hungry and you're just regretting going. We went to Charlie Trotter's to Chicago and he's like a f Michelin star, like a bunch of fancy restaurants. I took Danielle for Valentine's Day. Hated it. Absolutely hated it. Ordered a pizza on the way home. It was like the <laughs> worst, like, it, yeah, eight course. Well, I did something in Minnesota where it was her birthday, and I'm like, uh, we ate in the kitchen at, like, where they were preparing the food, just Danielle and I. Yeah. In the kitchen. Like, they set up a table for us, and that cost, like, a gazillion dollars, and we've done all kinds of crap. Always the worst. The best meal I've ever had, and this is the honest to God's truth, with, with like, a big event, I was playing with the Houston Arrows. We went to Milwaukee, and one of the guys knew an Italian restaurant the owner in Milwaukee, and we just threw down. We went there. It was like four hours in some random hole in the wall Italian restaurant in Milwaukee, drinking wine, eating food, like all this great meats and stuff and platters. We sat there for four hours and got just, just like served every every kind of Italian stuff, and it cost us like 80 bucks. It was so fun. Yeah. It's – I, I – the experience. There's a reason. How long has humanity been in existence, Tim? Uh, modern that, humans have been around for about 300,000 years. 300,000. There's 300, a reason. Yeah. We've whittled, whittled it down to like some pretty good options for food. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like we figured it out. We don't need to reinvent the wheel at this point. We know what tastes good. Ribs, pork, chicken, steak, the staples. Those are good. You don't need to be eating chicken hearts. You know what I mean? And like, uh, this was boiled in sheep's liver and we used the stomach as a sausage casing. And then we're going to take the neck of a fish and we're going to inject it with the eyeball of a cow. It's like, what, what? They're just doing it to be different. It doesn't taste any better. Just, just stick to, stick to what works, but do it well. Simple. Yeah. One of them was duck breast and I've never had <sighs> duck before. And I just like, it was very like gamey and, and, and chew, like I'm just chewing and chewing and chewing. And I feel like I'm not making any progress on it, you know? Meanwhile, like the two others that were fruities are just like, just like they couldn't contain their excitement. No. Just sighing with every bite. Oh, mm, yeah. They're doing it just to put on a show. They don't think it tastes good. They really don't. I challenge them to, <laughs> to tell me it tastes good because I, I've eaten the best food out there and it sucks. We went to, we, before we came on, I took the kids to Cracker Barrel after church on Sunday. Because Danielle had some baby shower with her friends, and I'm like, "What am I doing?" Cracker Barrel it was fantastic. I got the chicken fried steak. They all got burgers and macaroni and cheese and chicken tenders, and we got lemonade and we played games. We were there for like an hour and a half. Seventy seventy dollars all in for all of us. It was beautiful. <laughs> like you know, I was out of there for under a hundred dollars, and we fed eight people. It was great. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I tried it. I ate some things I've never eaten before and things I never thought I would eat, but um, there's a certain type of person that, that seeks those types of experiences and I'm just not one of them. I will say this. When we went to Norway, we were, I don't want to brag, but we, yeah, we, we went to Norway and we were just walking around this market and I saw one of the meats and it was a whale. I'm like, oh, whale. That's interesting. We never tried that before. And so the guy's like, yeah, you know, order us, order a whale steak. It was mink. So I ordered the steak and he's like, hey, you want some like raw? I was like, yeah, let's try some raw whale. And he cut me off a little slice and it was pretty good. It, was, it was, wasn't like terrible, but it was not bad. And I joked to the kids, I just felt really strong after eating it because I'm like, whale, it's the best. But like you go to Australia, 
you have like crocodile and kangaroo. That's what you do. You just try to try the local flavor, I guess. But you're not like you're in North Carolina. What are you doing eating chicken hearts? What's the matter with you? It sounds terrible. How big were they? That's they're they're small. They're like uh, I'm holding my hand, but it's just like uh, I don't know a little. It looks like it's about the size of a um, uh, what do you call it? the Franks? The little tiny hot dogs. You know the. Uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about, but yeah, yeah. It, it was good. It was good. And, and the rest, the chef came out and he's like a world renowned has, I don't think he has a Michelin star, but he's worked at those restaurants and he's young. He's only like 42 or something. Super nice. Thank like, you for saying that. Everything. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. He's done so much with his life, John. What are you doing? Anyway, he, uh, <laughs> and, and they don't, they, the tip, he told us th that the tip, they don't tip anymore. It's like we cover, we pay our employees really well. So your tip will just be a go toward a donation to a charity. Which was nice. And, you know, the whole thing was really nice, but it's just, it was a lot. Chicken heart. Lot. Chicken heart, duck. They ended with this little ice cream that had like a smoked, smoky feel to it, smoky taste. Anyway, I'm sure people are sick of hearing about this, but I had to share the experience. But like, would you rather have a little tiny piece of a smoky ice cream infused with cedar? It was uh, made on cedar planks or just go to an ice cream shop and get like soft serve twist dipped in chocolate. Sounds delicious. Yeah. Simple. So there's simple. Simple is better. All right. Moving on. We got to get out of the show. Enough of your foodie stuff because oh, Cracker Barrel was so good. I'm telling you, yeah. what, go go there. It's delicious. All right. Moving on. College hockey team. They finally crowned a champion in the college hockey. They whittled it down. My Michigan Tech Huskies barely missed out. They lost to the Boston University Terriers. Well, guess BC. what? Huh? They lost to BC. No, they lost yeah, to BC. Well. <laughs> Same thing. BU and BC. Yeah. I, I always um. No, they're one and the same. Anyways, BC made it to the national championships. They played Denver, the Pioneers. Huge game. BC, massive favorites. They got all kinds of stars. They're just clipping along, haven't lost in forever. Well, lo and behold, Denver pulls off a massive upset. 2 nothing. beats the Boston College. Is it Terriers? Eagles. Eagles. Fantastic game. Probably one of the best saves I've ever seen. In a huge game made by the Denver Pioneers goaltender. I don't know his name, but he came across. It was early in the third. Denver was up 2 nothing. Boston College was on a power play. The captain makes a beautiful backdoor pass wide open at the Denver goalie. Just flies across. Absolutely flies across. Make a huge glove save. Won the national championship for them. Because if they, if they score there, it's a completely different game. There's 17 minutes left, and it's anybody's game at that point. But beautiful finish. BC. Cutter Gauthier before the game. Just talking smack about, oh, the other team's going to be crying after this game. It's going to be real fun for us. We're going to get the W. Well, he's eating his words. He's done. Just bulletin board material for the Denver Pioneers, and they use it. They won the game. Congrats to them. Congrats to the Boston College. What do they call again? Eagles. Eagles. Come on, man. Very exciting. Very exciting finish. College hockey's good. It's, it's progressed leaps and bounds since I played. When I played, there was one good line on each team, maybe two. There's some talent there. Every single line is just clipping along. They're playing very fast. It's very, very good hockey. If you haven't checked it out, you you should do yourself a favor and when watch a game next year because it is fun. And then these guys are literally transitioning right from the finals, right from their playoffs, right from their last game of the season into the NHL, and they're making an immediate impact. I watched a game last night. Frankie Nazar. Frank Nazar the third played for the Chicago Blackhawks, made his debut versus the Carolina Hurricanes. Scores. First game. Breakaway. Fantastic player. He's buzzing around the ice. He looks really, really, really solid. He played for the University of Michigan. He's going to be a good player for the Chicago Blackhawks. I want him to play with Connor Bedard, but they did not put him with him last night. They put him with, I think, the third line. But anyways, very exciting. Cutter Goche, the aforementioned that I just said, he will make his debut with the Anaheim Ducks tomorrow night. Last game of the season for Anaheim. One game left. He signs a contract. Going to go to Anaheim. Mind you, this is the guy who did not want to play for the Philadelphia Flyers, told them earlier this year, he said, I have no intention of signing with Philadelphia. So if you don't trade me, I will just re-enter the draft. I'm, or I'll be a free agent. He's like, I, I won't sign in Philadelphia. That's why the Jamie Drysdale trade happened. Cutter Goche goes to Anaheim. Drysdale goes to Philadelphia. He's playing his first game tomorrow, I believe. And he's a good player. He just set a new record for the NCAA most goals in a season with 38. Hasn't been done in 25 plus years. So the guy's... Kid's good, Tim. Kid's very, very good. Lane Hudson, going to make his debut with Montreal Canadiens. I don't know much about that kid. What's what's his deal? 
He's very good. He's not very big, but he but he plays very hard. And we saw him at the World Juniors, and then he played very well for uh, for BU, I believe. So he's a he's a great little player. And he's yeah, also and that's to play this week. Yeah, that's that's going to be the norm. I think it's you know you have the the trade deadline, you have all these different opportunities to sign players going down into the playoff. But you look at what Kale McCarr did. You look at what I bet you Cutter Gochi of Anaheim was in the playoffs. He'd make a huge deal. Is this the norm now moving forward where teams can re- just expect to have their college hockey stud just jump into the lineup and interject some use, some energy, some just scoring or whatever they bring to the lineup? Because it's it's a free player. Like Cutter Goche will be a top two line guy for the Anaheim Ducks. Frank Nazar could have been a first line player in his first game. That's how good he played. Is this something we can just expect moving forward? Does, he, does the NHL have to address this? Because this is just adding a free player for the playoffs, basically. A, a solid young star could come in and just make a huge impact for the playoffs. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it's fair. I haven't heard anyone complaining about it. You know, I mean, it's a fair point, though, that it's going to happen more and more often just because ho- college hockey has gotten so good. In the last 15, 20 years, you know, you'd have one or two guys maybe at each, um, not, not even every year, but one or two guys as college hockey came to an end, like Tory Krug made his debut in the playoffs. Justin Schultz, something similar. He, he came up with Edmonton, I believe, originally. Danny DeKaiser with the wings. Like, there were a couple of names that every so often would come up. Now it's going to be like two or three to five every year. It's going to happen. Just because these guys, are, these kids are so good. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't think it's an issue. Do you think it's unfair to certain teams? Yeah, I think it is an issue. And I think it will be. The reason it hasn't been is because it wasn't a thing. College hockey wasn't as big as the OHL, the WHL, major junior hockey. So as college hockey gets more popular, and they they start getting more and more talented players. Yeah, it's it's nice now when it's five to ten players. Fast forward this ten years, when you have an influx of thirty to fifty players going into the NHL and making an impact right away. And if you're a contending team and you're up against the cap, you're like, I'm gonna grab this kid. He's gonna be a first line player. He's a stud. I feel like there has to be some kind of bar of games played before you can just play in the playoffs. You just can't add somebody like a Cutter Goche. Yes, you know, he's under contract. I get that you signed him last minute, but you can't just add him for the playoff. There, I don't know. I think there needs to be some kind of checks and balances where you have to have some footprint in the NHL throughout the season in order to play in the playoffs. I get it. If you're injured, that's a different scenario. But if you're just signing a kid right out of college, that to me, we we maybe need, need to deal with that because I, I don't think it's fair. I really don't like Frankie Nazar. None of these teams are in the playoffs. That's that's the big thing right now. Montreal, Chicago, Anaheim. These guys are impactful players going to those teams. If they were in the playoffs, it would be a big deal because you're adding a very, very high quality player for nothing. Is that fair? I don't know. That that's something that has to be addressed when the time comes. But anyways, Denver's head coach, Dave Carlisle, Tim, what's going on with him? Dave Carl, yeah, is reportedly getting NHL offers. These reports came out basically the night that they won the, the other night, just because he's just such a good coach, um, and he's going to get a- NHL offers this summer from multiple teams, most likely. And I think that's probably a good thing. You know, I like to see these college guys rise up the ranks and get opportunities at the NHL level, and I think it's also probably good to break up the old boys club so it's not just the same names all the time. Because there are a lot of good coaches right now who don't have jobs, um, like uh, Barubi is one of them. Obviously, you know, there are others, but um, I'd like to see him get a, a head coaching job this summer. And there are a lot of teams that need it. So it'll be good for them, too. Yeah. A name that just popped his head up recently did an interview, Joel Quinville, starting to kind of dip his toe into the coaching ranks again. He wants to get back behind the bench. And so he is doing the rounds, doing interviews. And I know we talked to Gary Bettman a while back. So don't be surprised. If you see his name thrown around for high coaching job, head coaching jobs come this offseason, because there will be some very, very coveted positions opening. Once the playoffs kick around, once teams start losing when they don't, you know, shouldn't lose like the Toronto Maple Leafs, the New York Rangers, teams like that. If they bow out early, don't be surprised if Joe Quinville's name is attached to a lot of those teams because he's a multi-time Stanley Cup champion. He's won the Jack Adams a few times. He's a heck of a good coach. So Keep an eye on that. It's nice that the the college coaches are coming up because hockey is one of the only, I guess baseball is the same way. They they don't recycle coaches from other areas. You know what I mean? They're not coming in from Europe. They're not coming in from 
the college ranks, they've rarely come up from the minor leagues. You mentioned the old boys club. Football, they're constantly finding coaches from former players, college ranks. Basketball, it seems like they have a very good system of just the G League, former players. They recycle coaches or replace coaches quickly. Hockey, it seems like they just have 40 guys and they just move around every five years. Okay, you're done. Let's replace you with uh, who's going to be here? Laviolette. Okay, you're done here. Let's let's put uh, who, whoever, Montgomery here. Oh, Montgomery, you're done here. It's just the 40 guys move around the league. So anyways, moving on. Speaking of head coaches, a guy made it. I put this on the agenda. It was a very surprising comment by Sheldon Keefe. He made about Austin Matthews. So Austin Matthews chasing 70 goals. He's got 69 right now. He's playing fantastic. But Sheldon Keefe is having a little bit of an issue when Austin is on the ice, how the team reacts to him being on the ice. Much like Alex Ovechkin in Washington, they're trying to get him the record. So everybody's funneling pucks to Alex Ovechkin on the power play when he's in the offensive zone. It's a point of interest. The same thing seems to be happening with Austin Matthews. And Sheldon Keefe addressed this after the last game. He said, I mean, obviously there's a major distraction. It doesn't help us what we're trying to accomplish on the ice, but it's exciting. I get it, and it's especially when he gets to 69, you can see it. It's really, it's it's growing, anticipating. And now you're feeding it, I'm feeding it. I want it to happen, but I want it, I wanted it for the fans, but I'm glad the game's over, let's move on. Interesting. Very interesting. And he was posed a question of Austin Matthews going for 70, so it wasn't like a, a leading question. I, you can tell he's frustrated. He doesn't like this push for Austin Matthews, just one player, let's get him the record, and you know that's all we're focused on. I, do you see some tension growing between Austin Matthews and Sheldon Keefe? Well, isn't wasn't he asked um, about how the the crowd goes nuts every time Matthews touches the puck? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's the part that I think he thinks is distracting. I don't know that he thinks Matthews is doing anything that's distracting. Right. I mean, that said, you don't hear anything like that from um, the Capitals coach about Ovechkin. You know what I mean? Like, and I get that they. I mean, they, they're playing for their lives right now, the Capitals, and the Leafs are going to make the playoffs and they know who they're going to play. So, yeah, it's a little bit strange, but I don't know. I, I There's not enough here for me to totally read into it. All right. I just think this this makes me nervous. Well, not makes me nervous, but it makes me think that Keith stays are done. And he's just frustrated by where the team's at. He, he doesn't think they're ready for the playoffs. That's what I think. I mean, he's like, we're trying to get this guy 70 goals. This isn't what we're here for. He's like, it's frustrating for him. So anyways, maybe it's a minor yeah. thing and I'm reading too much into it. But I saw that and I was like, huh, that's interesting. Two games before the playoffs. Maybe frustrated at his player that he's not playing the right way. He's just trying to score goals. The team's forcing it to him. Maybe he wants them getting ready for the playoffs. I don't know. Speaking of um, bold predictions, Tim, <laughs> at the beginning of the season, you and I, I, this last year, I'm still feeling the effects of it when I said Ovechkin's not going to get the record and he's going to start to slow down. We did bold predictions this year, like we do every year. Now the season's almost over, so it's time to recap how our bold predictions panned out. And obviously, none of them might pan out, maybe one or two, because they're bold predictions. Should you, should you start, Tim, or should I? Let's do every other. I'll go first. I um, Mine, which I thought for sure was looking good, was that after Eric Carlson had 102 or whatever last year, said another defenseman's going to get 100 points, not named Eric Carlson. It was looking so good for so much of the year. Quinn Hughes and McCarr were both on point, on pace for like 120 points, whatever. They've slowed down in the second half. Still excellent scoring, but Hughes has 91. Maybe he gets to like 94. You know, he's he's not going to get it. So we'll call that a fail, but it was close. But it's a fail. All in all, I, I think it's it's one thing to say close, and it's one thing to say you're wrong. You're wrong. Mine, Connor McDavid would get 175 points. Right out of the gate, it didn't look good. He wasn't scoring at the same record that he did last year. He just didn't look like himself. Then he got injured. He was out for a few games. And he came back. He's picked it up lately. He's playing really solid, but he has 130 points. That's, that's nowhere near 175. It's it's not great. So I, maybe that was a little bit much expecting him to – because what did he get last year? 163, I believe it was. 53, I think. I somewhere know. in that range. So, yeah, I, I was hoping he would uh, take the next step. But he obviously regressed, and he's um, he's just getting worse by the second. So that unfortunately didn't pan out. I'll just go jump to my second one because that one was derailed by injuries very early. Dougie Hamilton, I said he would lead the D-man in points and win the Norris. Guy gets hurt. What, what do you want me to do? He, he played great last year. He was supposed to have another great year this year. Probably the main reason why the Devils have struggled all season long. 
Dougie Hamilton, guy plays a half an hour, all facets of the game. He's been missed sorely by the New Jersey Devils. So that's a that's a big time fail with an asterisk. Not really my fault. It probably <laughs> okay. would have happened if he didn't get hurt. All right, Tim. Let's what talk your about number two. Let's talk about the Bruins because uh, both of these are for Bruins predictions. The next one for me, I had them winning the Atlantic, which at the time was a bold prediction because they had just come off. Obviously, the major disappointment last year, losing all their players, all these other teams are taking steps forward. So it was a bold prediction. Right now, it's looking pretty good. They're one point ahead of Florida with two games in, or one game in hand. So I think they're going to they're gonna lock it down. But too soon to say officially, but I'm going to say that's spot on. Not that bold of a prediction. They they won the President's but, Trophy last year. It was. And they, they keep their it. goaltending. They keep all their defense. They lose the most selfish player in the league, Patrice Bergeron. So not that bold of a prediction. So good for you, Tim. Pat yourself on the back. My prediction was very bold with the Boston Bruins. I said they were going to have the biggest points drop in NHL history, which is it's such a bold prediction. Man, oh, man. I don't know how I do these. But I was wrong. They've been you playing very good. You don't get credit for being bold if you're not even close on the results. You don't get credit for being like, well, hey, I was brave with my pick. Well, no. how many points did they get last year? Oh, uh, gosh, I don't know. 100,000? Like I don't one, know. One, 140, 134, I believe they got? Something like that. So they, they, they dropped like 25 points. That's still a lot. They might have gotten the record. I'll have to check. But, yeah, I, I was, I think, a little optimistic of their fall. Because they were the president's trophy winner. like, And then they lose some dead weight. And they're playing really, really good hockey. And they got friend of the show, Jeremy Swayman, playing lights out. All right, my, my third, my fourth bold prediction. I said Alex Ovechkin would lead the NHL in goals with 62. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. He's got 30. And just barely gets 30. He's just been so lucky the last month and a half of the season. He had eight through midway through the season. And he's just... Everything's going right for him. So I was off. I really wanted this guy to get 62, and he's only got 30. So my bad. I just, I'm a big OV fan, the great A. And um, yeah, I was wrong, that one. I'm sorry. All right, Tim, what about your fourth one? Yeah. Or your I've third. Been doing- I've been clipping along. I'm stealing all the, the airtime. I'll do a couple. I'll do a couple now. This is another bold one. This, I, was, I was excited about this one. Five teams in the Pacific make the playoffs. I was... Not even really close. Four did, four will. Um, but the next two teams up, if you look at the entire Western Conference, are both from the oh, Central. So oh. the Flames were the ones that uh, disappointed me, as well as the Kraken. So disappointing, just four. My next one is that three rookies would have 80 points. And I was predicting Bedard, Cooley, and uh, someone else. I don't remember who my third pick was, but not even close on that one either. Bedard is 60. He leads, the, he leads the league, and the others, they're doing okay, doing solid, but that uh, not close to that prediction. So I was wrong well, on that one. Fanatilli gets hurt. Bedard gets Fanatilli, hurt. Yeah, that was the third one. So maybe those two guys would get 80. But what's fun is nobody got 80 points as a rookie. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> you could have said 60 maybe and made it a little more likely. But 80, not that's bold, all. though. Not bold. A lot of credit it's for me bold. for going bold. All right, my last one I feel like is a win. I predicted Toronto and Edmonton to make the Stanley Cup Finals. So, so far, I'm going to give myself a yes because they're both in the playoff hunt. They're both still technically in it, right? So, there you go. That That's uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm going to give myself a yes on this one. And then your last yeah. one, too. My last one, both the Sabres and the Senators to make the playoffs. Not even close. Not <sighs> even close. Really disappointing. But what, what can you do? Not my fault. Not my fault. I actually saw an interesting tweet this, um, this weekend. They said the most, it was the most active games played by NHLers without making the playoffs. So most games played by active NHLers without making the playoffs. I was blown away by the amount of games that these players have played without even sniffing the playoffs. Number one on the list. Jeff Skinner, 1,002 games without making the playoffs. Isn't that, that, that's crazy. 1,000 games. Tim, that's, that's unbelievable to me. Yeah, it's a lot. I saw that list too. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it makes sense, the teams that he's played on, but still. I thought he would have snuck in with Carolina when he was there. I didn't realize they were that bad when he was there. But yeah, then he goes to Buffalo and that's like the whole list, the top 10 list. It's Skinner, Ristolainen, Gergensen, Darlene, Tage Thompson, Casey Middlehead, and Henry Yokoharu. Like, those are all Sabres guys. And you get Kachuk, Shabbat Shalom, 
in there too from Ottawa and then Philip Ronick, who will be out of there this year. And Casey Middlestead obviously is going to make the playoffs too. He'll make his debut, but 1,002 games with no, no hope on the horizon for Jeff Skinner. Like the, this is, he's staring down the barrel of a shotgun with the potential of never playing in the playoffs in his career. I play playoff games, Jeff Skinner, me, and I suck. And I play playoff games. <laughs> How does that feel? Oh, man. Imagine, just imagine how much fresher his body is, though, because he's never played playoffs. Like, he could play 2,000 games. He really could. At this point. Yeah. At this point. He, was, because, he started so young. He, he was an 18-year-old. Yeah. And you look at these other guys who play in the playoffs year in and year out. Like, we had Ryan McDonough on the show. The guy's never not made the playoffs. He's played an extra, I don't, want, I don't know the exact number, but it's hundreds of games that he's played extra. Skinner could hit 2,000 games. Potentially. He's one of those players. He's like a Tyler Ennis, but better. You know what I mean? If if he humbles himself the right way and he's like, I'll, I'll play on the third and fourth line. That's fine. I'll, I'll play league minimum. 2,000 games. There you go. I said it. Because how old is Jeff Skinner, Skinner right now? Let me pull it My up. Guess. What's yeah. your guess? 29. You think he's 29? He's been in the league, what, 10, 15 years? I'm guessing he's 31. If he plays to 40, there's a real world chance Jeff Skinner's 31, and he's got three years left on this current deal, Then he'll re-up again. If he plays to 38-39, that's my bold prediction next year. 2,000 okay. games. 2,000 games. He would only have to play 10 more years, and he's 31. I think it's very real. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine 2,000 games? But anyways, moving on to more important stuff. Deadline acquisitions, Tim. I, I saw real world acquisition last night when I watched the Carolina Hurricanes and almost friend of the show, Jake Gensel, was lights out. Him and Sebastian Ajo were very, very dangerous on the ice. It, did, it didn't translate into goals, but they were very dangerous. They're clicking. They're playing really, really well. And by the way, Carolina looked really good. I have been short selling Carolina maybe a little bit. I, I really enjoy the way they play the game. I forgot how aggressive they are. You think of Carolina, you think of a structured defense. You think of Rod Brindamore. You think everybody's accountable. They're playing safe. You think of the New Jersey Devils of the 90s, right? That's what you think of. That ain't this team. This team is aggressive. This team is in your face. This team is ever pressuring. The D-men are always up on the rush. They're always pinching in the offensive zone. It's really fun to watch. It's very rare you see a team play that way this way because it's very – it's 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 a gamble. You can give up odd man rushes. You can really be you know, caught – in the middle of nowhere, if you're not careful, but Rod's got these guys playing so well. They're so disciplined in the sense that if that D-man's pinching, you have a high guy, you're always protected, you're always covered. Man, that's hard. The Hawks couldn't do anything. It was a very, mind you, it was the Hawks. I'm going to watch a little more Carolina now, but they, it, was, <clears throat> it was a fun game. In front of the show, Seth Jarvis gets two goals, but very, very fun game. Back to Jake Gensel, Tim. What's he doing in Carolina so far since he's arrived? Yeah, in the 17 games that he's played for the Hurricanes, he has eight goals, 17 assists for 25 points, which over 82 games is 120-point pace. So he's plus 16. He's just been the, the best acquisition, and he's delivered on it. Um, awesome. The the big thing I was a little bit surprised by is not scoring more goals. He's a, he's a goal scorer first and foremost. He was a 40-goal scorer multiple times. That's primarily what they brought him in for, mostly in the playoffs. They, it seems like Carolina has always been – I think the – Stephen Wino said this last week in the interview. He said they're always one goal short, right? And that's yep. what cost them in the past. And that's what Gensel's here for. But he's delivered so far. He has great energy and um, um, synergy. What am I looking for? The Find teammates. it. Find it. <laughs> I'm blanking today. Tough night. Um, but he's he's looking really good so far. I think chicken hearts are bad for your brain. I think that's what it is. And you had two of them. You know what it is? I was uh, I was up last night because I couldn't sleep because I was my stomach was not the dinner was on Friday night, so this is not from that I don't think, but yeah, could be stomach issues last night. Chicken hearts. It, when you infuse your body with like something so random, it's like, what do I do now? How do I digest this? This is strange. It's like when Maybe. I eat sugar because I don't eat sugar a lot, and then I'll have like a couple donuts. I'm like, oh, I feel like garbage now. That's what chicken hearts would be like for you. I'm back to Gensel. I th I think he's Where playing great. Chemistry? What's that, Tim? Chemistry was the word I couldn't think of. He does have some pretty good I've chemistry with Aho. They they are clicking, and I notice that right away. They're finding each other. In he, the thing that I notice is Gensel can put the puck in your wheelhouse when you want it, where you want it. 
it's not like on your back foot. It's not on your front foot. You don't have to make an adjustment for the shot. He's very good at just placing it right where you want it. And I bet you he picked that up from Sidney Crosby because he's really good at that. But, man, they looked solid last night. And, again, grain of salt playing the Chicago Blackhawks, but they looked very, very good. All right, Kuzmenko, the acquisition the Calgary Flames got in the Elias Lindholm trade. And this is the one I, I don't want to say I called my shot on this one. But much like the Dubois trade with Ayafalo and Velarde, I said, watch out for Kuzmenko. And I picked him up on my fantasy team, Tim. So I was a man of my word. I said, this guy's going to take off. He was buried in Vancouver. He did not get an opportunity. He was playing behind the top two lines there. It didn't really pan out for him. He goes to Calgary. Well, lo and behold, look at who's just lighting it up. The guy's got 24 points in 27 games, 14 goals. He had a hat trick the other night. He's been playing fantastic. For a Calgary team that desperately needs a spark, they got Huberto, who sucks. Kadri's having an okay year. Kuzmenko could end up being the best, best player in this trade, the way Elias Lindholm's been playing. But very, very good fit for the Calgary Flames. Playing really, really well. And I listen, I'm not one to take credit when it's due, but I called this son of a gun as soon as it happened. I, I, knew, I knew it. And it's panned out perfect. You did. And, you know, I saw a Twitter clip this morning that – um that is not going to be known as the Elias Lindholm trade. It's the Kuzmenko trade now. You know, that's yeah. that's how good he's played. Lindholm is sort of disappointed. We'll see what happens in the playoff. Talk about him next. But Kuzmenko looks really, really good. And I'm really excited because it's one of the few things that the Flames can be excited about right now. Yeah, there's not much. It was it was beautiful last game. They played Arizona, and Arizona jumped out to an early lead. I was like, damn it. Like, I don't like when Arizona wins. Calgary slowly but surely came back, won at 6-5. So very good finish. For the Calgary Flames. And yeah, they need they need something to smile about. They really do. Because they are mired in just the unknown, right? You're you're in the depths of purgatory. What's going to happen? We traded away our D-man that we could have traded. We got Tanov off the books. We got Hannafin. We got Zadorov. We got some draft capital there. Now what? What do we do now? We're still paying Huberto for a million years. We still got Kadri locked in for a million years. What's next? You know what I mean? So it's nice that they have some actual NHL caliber players up front who can produce. So Kuzmenko, love that stuff. Speaking of the guy who got traded for, what's Elias Lindholm doing, or should I say not doing, for the Vancouver Canucks? Yeah, not doing a whole lot. He missed a little bit of time to injury, but he's played 24 games for them and is only five goals and 10 points. Uh, which is not great. They wanted him to be the, he was a 40 goal scorer a couple of years ago. They wanted him and help contribute to the offense. However, the thing that they primarily brought him in for was the the depth um, and center. He can play center and wings, very versatile. He's also very good defensively, very responsible. He's willing to kill penalties. He does the little things well and balances out a line that's going to go out and score a bunch of points. He's there to help, you know, offset that. Um, and he's done that pretty well. He, he still contributes to that. And it's going to come down to what happens in the playoffs for them. Yeah. They need him to do more. I mean, this is a guy coming from Calgary who averaged, you know, 60, 70 points throughout his career with Calgary. They need him to produce in the playoffs. That's what you get him for. He's been okay in the playoffs, 27 games, 17 points. So it's not like he's going to, you know, win the con Smythe. But he needs to be a good, solid player for the Vancouver Canucks. And I'm nervous. I really am. He hasn't fit in. He doesn't really have a line that he works well with. He's kind of bounced around. It, it it doesn't bode well for these Vancouver Canucks who were clipping along so incredibly well. And they went out and they swung for the fences. They said, this is the guy. They got some Jizorovs. They got Lindholm. And they were going to cruise into the playoffs and be the you know the top dog in the West. And all of a sudden, Lindholm hasn't worked. He's on the third line now. He's playing with Johnson and Garland. Are those guys the type of players he's used to playing with? He's used to playing with high-end talent. So it's not hasn't worked out so far. No, no knock on Connor Garland, friend of the show. But he ain't Brock Besser. You know what I mean? He ain't, He's not Makayev. He's not Pius Suter. This guy's used to playing with high-end players who can put the puck in the net. So we'll see if he can adjust. So far, it hasn't looked good for the Vancouver Canucks. Maybe buyer's remorse a little bit. He's going to leave in the offseason for nothing. Maybe to Washington Capitals, like uh, Wino said last week. All right. Who's another player that moved, Tim? Just a couple more. Tyler Toffoli. Uh, he's been okay. Six goals, nine points, and 16 games played. He's solid. That's all they really needed from him. They didn't need to like be a, a, a. They don't need to lean on him too heavily because they've got the horses already. Um, but he balances out their lineup, and we know that he's clutch in the playoffs. You know, Toffoli. You judge the acquisition of Tyler Toffoli, but what he does in the postseason, that's still to be determined. But so far, he's been okay. Yeah, it's funny how I, I'm just panicking about Elias Lindholm and criticizing it very, very heavily. 
But then Tyler Toffoli is kind of in the same boat. He had a few good games early on, but he's just really been quiet the last month of the season. Washington or Winnipeg's still been very, very good, but I'm not worried whatsoever. Tyler Toffoli is is not made for the regular season. We've seen what he can do in the playoffs everywhere he goes. He's he's absolutely fantastic. So yeah, this guy's going to step up. He's going to play great in the playoffs. Right now, he's just slotted in with Monaghan and Ehlers. Monaghan, another great addition, but I'm not worried. This yep. is a guy who could be the best player in the playoffs. And he, I don't know what he does. He's like a Jeff Carter type where he just turns it on. He knows how to perform when the lights are the brightest. So, so far, not great, but we'll wait. We'll wait a couple more weeks to see the real Tyler Toffoli. All right, last one, Tim. Anthony Duclair. This is one I'm very excited about. He's got Ooh. seven goals, 13 points, and 15 games played. Just excellent. And it's just, add him to the list. Tampa seems to always have like these little moves they make. These death acquisitions that ended up delivering huge for them, not making a ton of money, didn't cost them a ton. And Duke is looking to be another one of them. He looks really good. He had 11 points in the playoffs last year for Florida. So you know he can contribute. Um, I just love this move for them. He's playing really well so far. Yeah, they they always get those guys, right? Whether it's a Barkley Gaudreau, you get a Pat Maroon, you get a Nicholas Paul, you get these guys, even Anthony Sorelli. Like, I know he was drafted there, but. The, these guys who weren't like high end guys and they come in and they just light it up. Yeah, he's playing, he gets to play on the first line. Okay, can we just throw that out there? So he should succeed. The guy should get points, but there's one thing to be put on the first line and there's another thing to actually succeed and take off with that position and excel. And he's been playing great with the point in Kutra. There, he can keep up with them. He seems to be on the same page as they are. And when in doubt, just give it to Kutra. It's It's not a bad game plan. It's like, give it to Nikita, go to the net, and good things will happen. But good for Anthony Duclair. He bet on himself last year. Didn't really pan out. So he's hoping for kind of a redo this year. He's again up for a UFA. He's only making $3 million, and the guy has consistently scored goals his whole career. So he's hoping. He's still relatively young. He's only 28 years old. Maybe win a Stanley Cup, go deep in the playoffs. Then you can get your big ticket. Like he'd be bounced around. He went to Florida. He was in San Jose, finished in Tampa Bay now. So hopefully we can get a big ticket for Anthony Duclair. He's making $3 million, but the guy should be making what? Four or five, maybe? He scored 30 yeah. goals. He scored 23. You know, he's, he's a decent hockey player. So good for Anthony Duclair. Like to see that. All right, Tim. Let's do some quick hits here. Brought to you by DoorDash. Got the bag right here. Very exciting. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of 15 pesos or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter promo code NATION25. Only available in Canada. Sorry, everybody else. Subjects to change. Terms may apply. Terms will apply. But yeah, go to DoorDash. Everybody uses them. It is, you know. What else is there? You want food and you don't want to get out of your house, use DoorDash. All right, Mark Stone. This is this is a shocking thing, Tim. Very, very surprising. I did not see this coming. He skated with the team the other day. He's, he's starting to ramp up his activity level. He is getting ready for the playoffs. And signs are that he could make an appearance in the first round. This is remarkable. This has never happened before. Where a guy is out, he's injured, a high-end player placed on the LTIR. All of a sudden, he's ready to play. The same thing happened with his teammate, Thomas Hurdle. Remarkable. It happens to two players on the same team in a span of two weeks. It's crazy. And it's 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 neat how it works. Like if Mark Stone were to start skating like two weeks ago, they would be in big trouble because of the salary cap. And so it works out perfectly. It's just serendip. It's providential. I don't know how it always works out this way for the Vegas Golden Knights, but it does. So very, very good news. Did you see this news, Tim? What did you think of it? It's amazing. It's a miracle. I just, uh, it's just, it's really wonderful for them and and for the fans. And I think I, all the hockey fans around the league are recognizing this is just a really cool thing to happen to Vegas and people are taking it well. You know, they're supportive. Yep. They're, they're on board and they're just thankful that this, this guy is healthy again. And it's just really, it's just tremendous. It's really great to see. They're going to have Barbashev, Eichel, Marcia So, Hurdle, Stevenson, Carlson, Mantha, Stone. That's their top nine. <laughs> and then their fourth line is yeah. Wah, Kolasar, and Paul Cotter. That is scary. Then you got Hannafin, Heggy, McNabb, Theodore, Peter Angelo, White Cloud. 
that they beat Colorado last night. That's that's a lot. That's a lot of firepower. Like I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. If like there's a very real opportunity, Carlson could be like a fourth line center. The guy, the guy playing, has scored thirty plus goals in this league. Most likely Dallas in the first round, which is just it's not it's, fair. It's Toronto, Boston. You know, it's like these teams should both have a chance to go on runs, and they're not going to. If I'm Dallas, I am petitioning the NHL to do something. It's not fair. You work your keister off all season long. You win the President's Trophy. Where they're slotted in right now, they're one point behind the Rangers, but they have you know a good chance of winning the President's Trophy. And then you get to play the defending Stanley Cup champions who, if they were playing in the regular season, their salary cap would be $100 million plus. The stuff, is that, is that fair? Is it? It's not. It's I not. guess it is because they're allowed to do it. It's just a, that Kelly McCrimmon, that guy's, he knows how to do it. All right. Ugh, the Coyotes. Yeah, I knew you'd like this one. So what are they doing now, Tim? There was a report from Sarah Valley. He said earlier this season, the Coyotes weren't paying their hotel bills and hotels around the league banded together and demanded the Coyotes paid for their hotel stays up front with a certified check, meaning their reputation was so destroyed among these hotel owners that even giving a regular check up front wasn't enough, had to be bank certified, which is just crazy and i you know it's just salt on the wound for the reputation of this owner and this and this franchise and i don't know just verifies even more that they need to be a change yeah complete dysfunction there it's always been a mess and now do you <laughs> did you see the the ticket prices for the final game in arizona Thousand bucks to get in the building. Yeah. yeah so dumb absolutely just insane but it, it, the crazy part to me is gary batman and this is a backdoor thing but i've heard from people that I talk to and I know and I see, if Arizona goes ahead and builds a stadium in the next five years, they'll get a new franchise. Why? Why? Because a bigger arena is going to make it better? They had a huge arena. I played at it. The Gila River. Nobody came. This, but just They got kicked out of Gila River for not paying their bills. That was I a don't. different ownership group, wasn't it, though? Same team. I, I just don't understand why he still wants to put a team there. I, I I really don't get it. All right, moving on to the playoffs. More important stuff. We have our first official matchup in the West Coast. The Jets and the Avs will face off in the first round. They are 2-3 in the Central Division right now. Dallas Stars locked up the first place. It's a pretty good first round matchup. It, it's it's going to be a slobber knocker. These are two really good teams. These are two teams who would not surprise me if they made the Stanley Cup Finals. Interesting. Who's a... Who, We'll we'll save it for our show, but who do you like? Just quick. The Jets are three and zero against the Avs this year, so that's a real tough one for me. But I would still go with the Avalanche. Oh, the game. You like love the Avalanche. It makes me sick. You like love Whatever. them so much. We're supposed to be unbiased, and you like just got this <laughs> man crush for them. All right, let's just a brief recap on the remaining games. It's a big week. There's still a lot up in the area in the Eastern Conference. The Western Conference is locked in, but people are still jockeying for seeds. But in the East. It, it's it's gotten crazier. Well, the Islanders, I think, are locked in. They're third place in the Metro. They have 90 points. They play the Devils into Pittsburgh to finish off. The, and the Pittsburgh, they play the Devils and the Penguins to finish off the season. So they'll make the playoffs. The second wild card is where it's at. The Capitals vaulted over the Penguins this, this uh, week. They're at 87 points. They play Boston and Philly. The Wings are tied with them at 87 points, but the Capitals hold the spot because of regulation wins. They play Montreal-Montreal. The Flyers are right there, too, at 87 points. They play Washington. The Penguins are at 86 points. They play Nashville and the New York Islanders. Some huge games here. Every team has an avenue to make the playoffs. The Capitals, I think, have the hardest road right now. They play Boston and then a huge game versus the Philadelphia Flyers. The Wings, like you said, Tim, you predicted, have the easiest road to make the playoffs. But I did say those two games scare me. And... There's a good chance they just tank both of them. It's a home and away, home and home and home, back to back. That'll be interesting. And then the Penguins, two very hard teams in Nashville and the New York Islanders. So I have no clue how this is <laughs> going to pan out. None whatsoever. Are you still sticking with the uh, the Wings pick? 
Well, while you were talking, I'm thinking, okay, like who who are my picks? Who am I going to say? I don't even have a guess because if you look at like even the Isles technically haven't locked it up yet. If they lose out, which they could do, yeah. the Devils and the Penguins are could be two tough games. Um, but you got to think they're going to get at least one or two points in those two games. And so they should be in it. Then four teams that are basically tied is just so crazy. Um, the Wings do have the easiest matchups, but something about that doesn't feel right. Like it feels kind of scary. You're playing one of the bottom five teams twice in a row. It's hard to beat a team twice in a row, especially on back to back nights. So I'm going to go with the Islanders and the Capitals. You're switching. Oh, your- no, because the Capitals are playing Boston and Philly. Man, I don't know. I don't even have a guess. I'm just not going to guess. I can't be wrong if I don't guess. So what do you think? I'm I'm sticking with my Penguins. I think they're going to vault all these teams. They'll beat Nashville. They'll beat the Islanders. And the Capitals will lose one game. The Wings will lose one game. And the Flyers will beat Washington. But Penguins will win two games. And they'll have 90 points. The Flyers will have 89. And all the other teams will be at 89. The, the Penguins will be at 90. That's what I'm hoping happens. But I... Capitals make it in. I'll be so mad. I'll be so upset if they make it in. But they, like right now... Looks like they will because the Bruins stink. The Bruins are so disappointing. Do you see Pasternak's two seconds left? Rips a slap shot versus the Penguins. Yeah, I hated that. And Crosby was pissed at him. And he was right to be. It was yeah, a weird, I agree. weird little thing. Didn't no no reason to do that. Like just you're going to hurt the goalie. Is that is that what you're really trying to do? And you can tell him maybe he felt bad afterwards, but I, I don't know why he did that. But anyways, I think that's all, Tim. Very exciting stuff. We'll have a lot to talk about on Wednesday. I'm not going to do a show on Friday because I'm traveling. Last Hawks game, very good. I'm going to bring the family, so we're down to two shows this week. So we're going to have to really fire it up on Wednesday, do a big extravaganza. But hey, until that time, thanks for joining us, everybody. We really appreciate the support. We will talk to you then. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Dropping the Gloves with John Scott, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.